Hello and welcome. In this video, we'll take a look at how Mad Max Fury Road cars performed in real life. Let's begin. Fury Road has possibly the craziest looking cars in the entirety of Mad Max franchise, but looking cool comes at a price. Even though the vehicles were required to be fully operational, some of them were regarded as difficult to work with, some were called death traps, and some were so dangerous to drive that they did not even make it into the movie. So in this video we'll take a look at a few Fury Road cars that caused some issues for the production crew. The Giga Horse. This wasteland monstrosity was created by stacking two Cadillac Coupe de Ville's on a custom frame rolling on tractor wheels, which sounds impressive, but it also posed a big challenge for the builders. Originally, the idea of a functional twin-engine setup was so unrealistic that the first instinct was to simply install a single engine and just hide it underneath a fiberglass shell, but fortunately, Colin Gibson, Fury Road's production designer, went out of his way to provide additional budget which allowed to equip uh, the Giga Horse with an actual working twin engine. It consisted of two Chevrolet big block V8 crate motors with fabricated manifolds and functioning 8-71 superchargers. Those with a keen eye will notice that the Giga Horse also has turbochargers, but those were in fact non-functional on the account that their rotors were removed. A similar practice was applied to Nux's car and its fake turbo setup. The two engines were connected through a straight-cut gear system designed by Anthony Natoli of Natoli Engineering, and in result they generated approximately 1200 horsepower. However, this power had to be transferred to the wheels, somehow. A custom gearbox adapter was modeled by Jacinta Leong in AutoCAD. All the components were water jet cut and originally connected to a Turbo 400 automatic transmission. And that was the biggest problem with the Giga Horse. This transmission had to be rebuilt after every single day of filming. I mean, could you imagine a Morton Joe just having to rebuild the transmission after each drive? Well, neither could Mark McKinley, who had the task of taking it apart and reshimming all the gears. So, eventually, Turbo 400 was replaced with Allison Automatic Truck Transmission to remedy this issue. This engine and drivetrain setup allowed for the speed of 125 km per hour, according to Colin Gibson, but in reality, the massive hubs gave a 16 to 1 drive ratio for the top speed of 95 km per hour, so it wasn't exactly a speed demon that the movie made it out to be. Frankie Frank Holden FX Utility, otherwise known as Cranky Frank, is one of very few vehicles that were not created with Fury Road in mind. This vehicle was built just out of boredom by Colin Snapper Macy and his stepson Sam Spud. It was designed to do two things. One, to look cool, and two, just do some sweet burnouts in the small country town of Inveral in New South Wales, Australia. It was just a true bush bashing creation built for fun. Um, its first incarnation shows that it was a beat-down, chopped and skewed take on a Holden FX Ute, but even then it had the name Frankenstein. It later even had a bonnet, but really, who needs a bonnet when you can shove a 300 horsepower 383 Chevrolet V8 in there and slap a huge GM 8V92 supercharger with a custom injector hat made from truck exhaust pipes? The most interesting thing about this engine was that it was actually fully functional, albeit running pretty hot, so it required two radiators to keep the, you know, its temperature at bay. However, as functional as the engine was, the overall functionality of Cranky Frank can definitely be put in question. Or as Fury Road stunt driver Dane Grant puts it, man, this thing was a nightmare to drive. I mean, one can define nightmare in many ways, but in this particular case, it meant you were driving practically blind. The visibility from the cab of this rat rod was so low, it's almost as if somebody went out of their way to make the driver just stick out their head outside the window just to even know where they're going. And all of this due to three factors. One, the roof was chopped, lowered, and a sun visor was installed, leaving only 185mm gap for the driver to look through. Secondly, 
the obvious culprit, a massive supercharger just right in the middle, blocking the view. And thirdly, it's like almost an insult to injury, the car had a center seat for the driver. So you can imagine it's pretty difficult to see where you're going if you sit right in the middle of this car, looking at the back of a gigantic supercharger instead of the road, and the only way of knowing where you're going is to look through 18 centimeter slits on the sides. Thankfully, this vehicle was at least uh, adapted to uh, Namibian terrain with brand new set of off-road tires and lifted suspension, but otherwise, this vehicle was a disaster waiting to happen. Especially if you add a whole bunch of other cars to the mix that generated clouds of dust and obscured driver's vision even more. Which in short meant that Cranky Frank was just inches away from crashing into things, or should I say that it still is, because ironically, it's one of the only 15 cars that actually survived the filming of Fury Road unscathed. I don't know, maybe it should be recalled to Lucky Frank instead. The Peacemaker Bullet Farmer's flagship vehicle, a post-apocalyptic hybrid of a tank and Australian muscle heritage in the form of a Valiant Charger shell. Combined with military decorations such as bullet casings and parts from a Cessna plane, this vehicle has more roots in the military than you could even imagine. It is based on a How & How EV1, Extreme Vehicle 1, quote-unquote Ripsaw light tank built for evaluation by the United States Army. The Ripsaw platform comes in many flavors. It's unmanned, remotely controlled or fully autonomous, as well as luxury models with a fully enclosed body and passenger seats inside the cab. How and how were tasked with creating a special order Ripsaw for Fury Road. The first requirement being they had to do it on the cheap, because Colin Gibson had no intention of paying more than $240,000 for this vehicle. He actually wanted to pay half of that. How and how agreed to build it, however, under the condition that the vehicle would be delivered without clutch packs and would be equipped with brake steering instead. But maybe they were too preoccupied being in front of the cameras, or maybe it was the low price of the vehicle that caused it to be, well, half-baked, to put it mildly. The issue started with the engine. Colin Gibson required this vehicle to have a supercharged V8 instead of a standard diesel engine that it came with. How and how delivered on that, except when Repsol landed in Australia, the water-cooled V8 Merlin immediately overheated and the brakes just caught on fire. The brakes were fixed by Mark McKinley, Fury Road's chief mechanic. Then, during testing in Broken Hill, the engine swallowed a bunch of sand and cylinders had to be rehoned. After that, one of the truck guide wheels fell off and bent the differential. After replacing the wheel, straightening the differential and removing the track assemblies, the team discovered that they were half-welded only on the exposed sections. So, uh, that's not good. Once the vehicle made it to Namibia for filming, the motor had to be replaced once more, this time with a smaller 502 Chevy engine. A wide array of new equipment was installed just to keep this vehicle going. A new electric water pump, uh, Ford Falcon's single core radiators, EWS water pump fan controller, a secondary battery with Anderson plug. Regardless, this vehicle's tracks would only last only a month before they broke. The cost of tracks was estimated at 18,000 US dollars. So a special diesel bath was made to try and keep the salt out of the tracks to preserve them. In short, this vehicle was a mess and one of the most dangerous vehicles on the set of Fury Road. It was openly hated by most of the crew that it had to constantly fix and refine its original design. Bullet Farmer's Ripsaw finally met its demise in Namibia. It was crushed and ground into fist-sized chunks to pretty much the joy of everyone that had to put up with it. Giggle Horse We now move away from vehicles that cause problems but were actually seen in the movie and venture into the realm of vehicles too dangerous to even appear on screen. Giggle Horse was a small buggy cobbled together from a spare Knox car shell. This Chevy 1934 five-window body was sitting on top of a very small custom-made buggy chassis with a motorbike engine installed backwards, which gave it another name, Lisdexia. You know, as in dyslexia, right? This car was rolling on very small wheels, but it doesn't mean that it couldn't keep up with the rest of the Armada. It definitely had enough power and maneuverability to do that, but if the Giggle Horse was like a, you know, well-trained pit bull, the Giggle Horse was more like a clumsy golden retriever puppy just hopped up on energy drinks. The issue with this speedy little thing was that it was just too easy to roll over. And, you know, it being the Giggle Horse's companion car, 
it could have easily ended up under its wheels, given the right circumstances. And that was enough of a reason not to put it on screen. Well, almost. It ended up on the car carrier and was driven around for the most part of the movie. Interestingly, this spare Chevy 5-window shell survived filming and actually ended up in private hands, most likely to be turned into an actual real hot rod. The Edge Products Ballistic Also known as the Moon Buggy, this was a loaned vehicle based on the buggy designed for Class 1 off-road racing in Western Australia. Using Subaru WRX engine, custom space frame chassis and 19-inch twin tire wheels, this buggy proved itself to be nothing but trouble for everybody involved. For the movie, it was dressed in a Holden HT Kingswood sedan body as an obvious throwback to Australian car culture. And right off the bat, it was clear that this buggy has not been used in a while. But that was the least of its problems. The key issue with it was that it had absolutely terrible steering geometry. Custom twin wheels were not helping either. According to one of the mechanics that would like to remain anonymous, those were two homemade wheel frames on each side with motorbike tires that had seen better days. The crew had quote unquote great fun trying to straighten them out too. The rear wheels were replaced with standard off-road type, but it didn't help the moon buggy much at all. Hitting the brakes would end up going tail first. Another glaring issue with this buggy was that it was in fact very difficult to get into, which logically means that it was also very difficult to exit. And it's not something you want to hear as a stunt driver. And to top that off, dressing it up in a Holden HT Kingswood sedan body made it just a little bit more difficult to get in and out of. Nothing could convince Fury Road's drivers to use this vehicle on set. So while this vehicle might look like something that would definitely fit the world of Fury Road, the real world proved that it was just a death trap and potentially a very costly lawsuit waiting to happen. For this, the car never even made it to Namibia. The Holden Kingswood shell was taken off and the car was sent back to its original owner. So there you go, a little bit more insight into the cars of Fury Road. Of course, I only covered a few of them because there's like 150 of them and there's just no time to do them all in one video, but I'll get to them later uh, with time in future videos. So, I hope that you liked this video, and if you liked it, you know, leave a like, subscribe, hit the bell icon, and wait for more videos. Until then, stay shiny and chrome.